All right. Hello, Harrisburg Academy Middle School. When whoever else that happens to uh, chance upon this video, uh, my name is Mr. Smith, and we're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons today in preparation for our Dungeons and Dragons Middle School Club, and also uh, what's called Roll Twenty, which is a platform in which you can play Dungeons and Dragons. I assume most people have heard about the game or know of Dungeons and Dragons, but I want to give a little bit of background information, uh, get people up to speed on what the game is about. So Dungeons and Dragons has been around since the 70s. Over here on this on the screen, I've got a picture of one of the earliest versions of the game, not the earliest, but uh, dating back to the 70s. Um, I started playing in the 80s, so I'm not quite that old, but I've been playing for a very long time. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is what's considered the very first role-playing game. Hopefully you've all heard of RPG video games, uh, Final Fantasy, Dragon Age, Dungeon Siege, uh, The Witcher, <coughs> there's lots of them out there. Um, a lot of those are very combat concentrated. The idea of a role-playing game in general is that you are taking on the role. You're basically like a player or an actor in an ongoing movie in which you get to uh, fill the role of a party member in a group of, say, adventurers. So I've got some pictures of adventuring parties here uh, from various games. <coughs> the original Dungeons & Dragons, or D&D, was very much kind of based on Tolkien. So I got a picture of uh, Lord of the Rings here. Uh, it follows a lot of what we call standard fantasy environments. There's orcs and wizards and dwarves and hobbits. Um, and they live in a fantastical world with dragons and trolls and, uh, and lots and lots of magic. Uh, uh, most role-playing games are generally, like I said, based off this, this standard idea of a fantasy environment. Uh, this picture up here is the latest edition of Dungeons & Dragons, which is the 5th edition. So you'll hear referred to as D&D 5e for the 5th edition of Dungeons & Dragons. It's probably the most popular version ever. Uh, it's very much in the mainstream now. There's a lot of Twitch channels such where you can watch people play Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, Critical Role is a very popular one. Uh, Acquisitions Inc. by Penny Arcade is very, very popular. Uh, so Dungeons & Dragons is probably more in the mainstream now than it's ever been. So it's a very exciting time for us old school Dungeons & Dragons players. Uh, we get to see a lot of new interest in the game we've loved for decades. So the hope is to give you guys an idea of what the game itself looks like, um, take you through some basics, and also talk about Roll20, which is the environment in which you can play Dungeons and Dragons online. So, um, <clears throat> in Dungeons and Dragons, you have a set of stats um, which are tracked in a character sheet. I've got a sample character sheet over here on the right. This is a paper character sheet for an actual game uh, that a friend of mine, that's his character sheet in a game that I run. And your character sheet pretty much defines your player character in the game. You assume this role, and you have certain attributes and abilities that define what you can't do, um, define your role in the party. Uh, just like in Lord of Rings and these pictures here, normally there's a party of adventurers, and there are various roles, just like there are in like MMOs like World of Warcraft. There are fighters and tanks and wizards and rogues and healers and support classes. Um, there are ranged fighters versus melee fighters. Uh, we kind of have all those same roles uh, in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so each character kind of fulfills a role in their party. Uh, this particular character is a big, beefy frontline tank fighter. <coughs> And we'll go through what some of these uh, some of these things mean. Uh, typically, when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, you play on a tabletop with your friends, and you roll a lot of strangely shaped dice to determine the results of all your actions. Uh, the twenty-sided die, or D twenty, uh, being the most common, which is where the roll twenty platform gets its name. And you roll those dice to see, you know, is your attack successful, or is your spell successful, or do you successfully evade damage? <clears throat> do you successfully find that trap on that treasure, treasure chest? So we'll look at how that looks in the Roll20 environment. So I'm going to switch over to Roll20. Here we go. This is Roll20.net. Excuse me. It is a what's called Virtual Tabletop, or VTT. So it allows you to play tabletop games 
in a virtual environment. It's become a very popular site the last couple of years, and even more so during the pandemic where people are locked in and can't play face-to-face. -face. So this is extremely popular. You can actually play a whole variety of different tabletop games with Roll20, um, but the most popular, most common is Dungeons & Dragons. So what that looks like, <clears throat> I just showed you a paper character sheet. In Roll20, we have virtual character sheets. So just like I showed you the paper character sheet, this would be a Roll20 virtual character sheet with your stats and attributes uh, that define what your character is, what your character can do, what equipment they might have, what spells and attacks they have at their disposal. So in Dungeons & Dragons, there are some basic attributes over here on the left that define your character. Um, strength is the first. Um, You'll notice that there is a number here, a small number, and then a large number here. These attributes are basically on a scale of 0 to 20. 20 being kind of almost superhuman, 0 being absolutely non-existent. Um, an average stat for a human would be around a 10 or 11. So if you're of this guy's of average intelligence, he has an 11 intelligence. Um, he's pretty strong. He's got a well above average strength, he's got a well above average dexterity. So what do these different attributes mean? Well, strength is pretty obvious. How strong are you? That'll help dictate how hard you swing a sword. Uh, if you're trying to bash down a door, you'd use that attribute. If you're trying to pull a friend out of harm's way, you'd use that attribute. Uh, how strong are you? This two here basically says you have a plus two for any strength-based act, based action. So if you're rolling a die, you're going to add a plus two to that die to make it even better based on how strong you are. Um, dexterity is the second attribute. Dexterity is how dexterous are you, how quick are you, how nimble, how uh, um, how's your hand-eye coordination. So if somebody is very dexterous, they're quick, they're nimble, um, they have good hand-eye coordination, they can do things like pick locks, uh, they'll use that to determine how, uh, how well you could, say, shoot a bow or an arrow or a crossbow. <clears throat> where it doesn't matter how strong you are for those, what matters is your hand-eye coordination. Uh, constitution is then your, essentially your health or your endurance. How tough are you? How resistant are you to disease? How much can you endure? Your constitution helps, defines, helps to define your hit points. Just like in any game you might play, whether it's a shooter game or a MOBA game or MMO game, you have a common, that's very common idea of a hit points. How many points of damage can you take before you uh, before you go down. Uh, constitution feeds into that. How sturdy are you? Intelligence is next. Intelligence is essentially book learning, um, knowledge. Um, this guy is not very smart because he's a fighter. He's much more interested in bashing things with his sword. So uh, your intelligence is kind of book learning, your knowledge. This is very common for, just like in Harry Potter, you have to study spells, so wizards need to have a high intelligence to be a good wizard. Um, uh, as opposed to wisdom, wisdom and intelligence usually kind of go hand in hand, but they're not the same thing in Dungeons and Dragons. If you're wise, that's really about being perceptive or street smart or, or savvy, having good common sense. So intelligence is book learning, wisdom is kind of savvy, how good are you at reading people, how good are you at uh, perceiving your environment. Um, those are all wisdom-based actions. And last but not least here is charisma. This guy is not very charismatic. Um, charisma means it's not only how attractive you are physically, but how are you with people, essentially? How do people respond to you? Uh, how is your, your force of personality? Can you impose your will on each other? Are you a natural-born leader? Or do people generally not trust you or, or feel generally um, uncomfortable around you? So this guy's got a below-average charisma. He's got a minus one in there. So any role he would make would have a minus one modifier instead of a positive modifier. So if this person is trying to make friends, he's going to have a hard time doing it. Whereas if he's trying to leap over a fence or climb a ladder or something, uh, or shoot a bow and arrow, his dexterity is very, very high. These are your base attributes. So everybody in the game has these base, attri base attributes, and they kind of define you know, how tough are you, how resilient are you, how smart are you, how quick are you, how do you get along with people. So whether you're a player in a game or an ally you meet or a monster, you'll have stats that mirror these six that give you bonuses on all your actions. That's kind of a basic idea of how we define 
a, a character, a monster, a creature in the game. Now, in addition to that, you also have a couple of very important stats. You have your armor class. Armor class defines how hard are you to hit with a physical attack. Obviously, what kind of armor you're wearing will play into your armor class, but also is your dexterity plays into that, because if you're nimble, you're hard to hit. So you, that makes your armor class even more, uh, even higher. The higher, the better in this case. Um, there are other ways to add to your armor class, things like having a shield or having magical um, defenses. Um, this ar so this armor class is not just the armor you're wearing, but just how hard, or how hard are you to hit. Uh, as I mentioned before, your hit points define how much damage you can take before you, uh, before you go down. In a lot of games, when you run out of hit points, you're dead, you die, you have to respawn or whatever, go to the next level. Um, in Dungeons and Dragons, when you reach zero hit points, you fall unconscious. So you're not dead, uh, but you're not up and standing and acting. So you just kind of lay there on the ground, and you slowly, uh, slowly bleed out. So that means your friends have a chance typically to tend to you, um, patch your wounds, uh, heal you up, and hopefully put you back in the back in the fight. So when your hit points reach zero, you don't just instantly die and your character goes away. Uh, you have a little bit of a buffer in there to uh, to keep you going. Uh, you also have a speed rating, how fast you can move around the board, and that is dictated by your uh, typically your race, whether you're a elf or a human or a short legged dwarf will mean you have uh, a limited speed uh, you can move per turn. So these are your basic attributes for a, <coughs> excuse me, for any player character. So at character creation, when you're deciding what you want to be, what kind of character you uh, you want to play, you would sort of divvy out from a pool of points to emphasize which your character is going to be. Are they going to be a wizard? You want a high intelligence. Are they going to be a fighter? You want a high strength. Are they going to be an archer? High dexterity. A frontline tank needs a high constitution. Um, <clears throat> you kind of decide where you want your strengths and weaknesses to be. Um, having straight uh, 16s would be somebody who's really, really good at everything. And that's pretty boring. You want somebody who's got strengths and weaknesses. So this person is very dexterous, but doesn't uh, get along well with others and is not particularly smart. So those could be limitations. You want an interesting character to play, not just a, uh, a Superman who just destroys everybody and, and uh, solves other problems without any challenges. Uh, there's some other aspects of this character sheet we'll talk about in a bit, but before we go any further, I want to talk about then classes and races. So in Roll20, over here there's these tabs with different um, information on them. This I is what's called the Companion. This is where we get game content, basically rules of the game, how the game works. And we want to look at classes. So as I was saying, Anybody who's played like an MMO or a MOBA, those are different roles often that a, a, a player might have. Could be a wizard, could be a frontline fighter, could be a, a backline glass cannon, uh, could be a healer or a support or utility uh, creature or character. We're going to look at the different classes that are available in D&D. So real quickly, <clears throat> this is just alphabetic order, but a barbarian should be pretty obvious. Barbarian is a type of fighter. Notice fighters here also. A barbarian is a fighter um, who goes, who kind of freaks out. He goes into a, what's called a barbarian rage. He's really all about off, all offense and no defense. Usually barbarians are lightly armored, so they're easy to hit, but they do a lot of damage, okay? They worry all about offense and not about defense. They typically use you know, great axes and huge swords and don't really worry about heavy armor and shields. They just want to do as much damage as they can before they, uh, before they collapse. Uh, opposed to, say, a fighter, a fighter typically is also a frontline fighter, but these guys usually are more armored, might have a shield, um, harder to hit, more of a tank than just a damage dealer. But these are both what we call frontline fighters. Um, going back to alphabetical order, the Bard is an interesting class. The Bard is a utility or a support class. Um, think of a, not a Bard like Shakespeare the Bard, but in this case a Bard is a storyteller. It's somebody who can inspire others. So they might sing or, or give speeches. The Bard gives bonuses to the whole rest of the party. So the Bard's kind of a jack of all trades. They can fight a little, they can cast some spells, they can inspire their, their compatriots. 
They do a lot of neat stuff. They're not great at any one thing, uh, but they're an all-around great utility class. A lot of fun to play. Because, uh, again, you can sing songs or maybe be a poet that inspires your, uh, your, uh, your hero companions. Um, a very kind of support and utility-based class. Uh, cleric is a, a priest, kind of adherent to a god in the setting. So the priest is a holy warrior who will cast spells, usually protective spells or healing spells uh, or buffing spells, uh, channeling the power, the divine power of their god to help the rest of the party. Uh, especially early on, a cleric is almost always necessary in a party uh, because of you need somebody to keep the fighters up and running. Otherwise, uh, as they get take damage, they go down. Uh, the cleric is there to swoop in, heal them, uh, mend their wounds, and get them back in the fight. Uh, a druid is a woodland priest, someone who lives out in the woods. Uh, druids can eventually shape change into animals, speak with animals. They're very earthy. They can also heal like a cleric does, so they're kind of a support role, but they are a spellcaster that derives their magic from nature. So they'll have things like they can command vines to come up out of the ground and restrain an enemy, or um, call down thunder, or speak with animals. Um, and they can eventually accept shape change into other animals. So kind of a fun, interesting class. We already talked about fighter. We'll talk about the monk. So the monk is kind of an eastern monk, uh, kind of like the crouching tiger, hidden dragon style monk. Uh, who studies a martial arts. So these are martial arts monks. Um, monks do not wear armor. Uh, they use either light weapons or just their hands and fists and feet to fight. Uh, they're very quick. They're very agile. Uh, to keep them alive, they're very wise. Wisdom is a very important attribute for those. So they actually see attacks coming ahead of time and kind of uh, have bonuses to the armor class based on their wisdom because of how much they've trained at deflecting blows or dodging away from blows. Um, so they do a lot of interesting things. They, they have magical powers. They channel their inner energy, what's called their key, into uh, special attacks. Uh, so they're very, uh, very agile, um, uh, very hand-to-hand -hand combat based class. Uh, the paladin is next. The paladin is another frontline fighter. Paladin is another holy fighter. Basically, a paladin is a, a holy knight. So they typically are a, a warrior for their, their chosen god who inspires them. So they are a frontline fighter, usually full of knightly virtue. But they will uh, be able to cast spells as well as fight in the front line. So they're kind of a mix of a cleric and a fighter. Kind of handy to have. Uh, a ranger then, think of Aragorn in the Lord of the Rings movies, if you saw those. They call him ranger. So a ranger is typically a woodland warrior. So somebody who's uh, out in the woods, surviving by their wits, uh, good in nature, good at tracking, uh, usually bow and arrow or, or light weapons. Typically they'll wear lighter armor so they can be more mobile. Uh, some rangers will have like an animal companion or a pet. This is another sort of type of fighter. Um, rogue is next. Rogues used to be called thieves in the early editions of Dungeons and Dragons and they would always kind of pickpocket their friends' uh, treasures and, and and steal stuff from the party. That got kind of annoying. They kind of redefined this class. A rogue is somebody who kind of hides in the shadows. They're usually lightly equipped, uh, light armor, very stealthy. Um, and what they do is they kind of sneak in and out of the combat. They have what's called sneak attack damage. So whenever the fighter is engaged with the big baddie, the rogue sneaks around the back and stabs the, uh, the dragon in the back without seeing, being seen. So rogues are all about stealth. They do a lot of damage because of their sneakiness. Uh, but they are uh, they're very uh, fragile normally. They don't have a whole lot of hit points, so they got to be careful when they're in combat. If they get stuck in uh, with a bunch of enemies, they're not going to be able to withstand damage like a fighter or a barbarian or a paladin could. Uh, the last three classes are all spellcasting classes. Um, you have a sorcerer. Um, the sorcerer uh, draws his magic from uh, either a, like a from. There's a couple different types of sorcerers. Uh, point being, the sorcerers kind of draw their magic from within. Um, they don't study spells the way a wizard does, it's kind of like the Harry Potter school of magic. Um, they draw their magic from uh, some other source. Um, their magic can be a little less reliable, a little more wild, um, but they are essentially a, 
uh, a wizard w without the studying. Uh, Kern are a little wilder, more uh, more random wizard. Um, the wizard is a, a more of a Harry Potter, Dumbledore style, studying books, uh, doing research, uh, reading over our arcane tomes of knowledge to gain powers. Uh, that's a standard wizard. They must study to learn their spells. Intelligence is their most important score. Um, They'll get more and more powerful as they advance, and they have a wide array of different spells they can cast. Uh, the Warlock is the last spellcaster. Uh, the Warlock is a spellcaster who's drawn his power from some sort of pact. He either has made a pact with a demon, or an otherworldly god, or some great ancestor who's given them some powers. They kind of fire magical bolts at their enemies, and they can, uh, they're almost like an arcane archer, somebody who casts spells. Uh, from afar. They don't have a lot of spells, but they have a lot of consistent damage. Okay, Unlike the wizard who can do a lot of different things, the warlocks only know a handful of spells. Uh, they rely on, on essentially magic um, um, magic blasts from the, uh, from the back row. They're kind of like, kinda like a, a, a wizardy archer type. Um, so three different basic spellcasters here. All the different sort of flavor or spin. Now, these are your classes. And again, they'll have different abilities that are important for those classes. So a barbarian and fighter will rely on strength. A rogue or ranger or monk will rely on dexterity. Um, your, your fighter will rely on, and also your sorcerer will rely on constitution. Your wizard will rely on intelligence. Your monk and your cleric will rely on wisdom. Uh, your Warlock and your Paladin will rely on Charisma. Um, so your class kind of defines what attributes are important. And you want to meld your character to match the class you want to play. Now, there are also then races. Here are the different races in Dungeons & Dragons. These are the basic races. <clears throat> Just like in Lord of Rings where there were hobbits and dwarves and elves uh, in the party. You can have a variety of different uh, races in the party. Uh, human is the most common. Uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, a human is very generic. A human can be anything. Uh, a broad spectrum of classes and, cho and choices. So essentially, a human is kind of a, a generalist. They can be good at anything. They're nice and well-rounded. Um, they don't have the super strengths or super lows or super flaws of other races. We'll talk about those here in a second. Um, a dragonborn is basically a half dragon, a human dragon hybrid, part dragon, part human, with some sort of draconic ancestry. So they've got dragon blood in them. They have a, a breath weapon. They tend to be big and strong. Um, tend to be barbarians or fighters or um, sometimes even sorcerers, since there's a draconic style sorcerer. So if you want to be big and strong and scary uh, and lay eggs, you can be a dragonborn. Um, a dwarf we all know and love from the, uh, the Lord of the Ring or Hobbit movies. A dwarf is short and stout, like it says here. So they tend to be very high in constitution. They're very strong. They're very good tanks. They're hard to hurt. Um, they're usually heavily armored. They favor fighters or clerics or paladins. Uh, you don't find a lot of uh, dwarf uh, wizards. Um, intelligence is not one of their important attributes. Um, elves. There are lots of elves in Dungeons and Dragons. These are all kind of based off the Tolkien elves. So I'll give this a second while it comes up. There are different types of elves. Uh, elves are very long lived. They can live to be 700, 800 years old. Unlike the Tolkien elves, which are immortal, they live forever. My website's a little bit slow right now. Um, there are different types of elves in Dungeons and Dragons. Just like in uh, in Lord of the Rings, if you watch that, uh, Legolas is a wood elf from Mirkwood, um, as opposed to Elrond was a, uh, a, a high elf. Just like that, uh, in, in Dungeons and Dragons, similarly, there's different types of elves. There are what are called wood elves versus... High elves versus uh, what are called dark elves or drow, which are subterranean elves. So high elves typically live in cities. Wood elves live in the woods. 
Uh, but all elves are generally kind of slight in build. They're not very strong. They're more nimble, fast, quick. Um, they're very intelligent. They can be very charismatic. Um, they tend to be rangers, um, rogues, uh, druids. Um, you can be an elf fighter, but it's a different style fighter since you're not as sturdy as, say, a dwarf or even a human. So elves tend to be a little frailer, but more dexterous, uh, perhaps more intelligent, or more charismatic. So they got the pointy elven ears. See if there's any more pictures here we have. Um, as you would have in, say, Lord of the Rings. Uh, elves are very popular for wizards as well. Uh, next we have gnomes. Gnomes look kind of like the uh, the Keebler elves. Uh, elves, they're kind of a, a cross between a halfling and a, uh, and a dwarf. Um, they're a little short, a little stout. The gnomes tend to be uh, tinkerers. They're inventors. They're, uh, they're mad scientists. Um, I can find some more pictures for you. So they value intelligence, they value inventiveness. Uh, I don't have any more pictures there for you. So a gnome's kind of a kind of a dwarf, they've they're kind of a dwarf elf uh, hybrid. Um, half elf is exactly what it sounds like. Half human, half elf. So they're kind of a midpoint between Elves and humans. Uh, they have some of the attributes of elves, they have some of the attributes of humans, which makes them very well suited for a lot of their roles. Um, diplomats are wonders. Uh, they can be very charismatic, so that's good for, um, for warlocks, that's good for paladins. Uh, they can be very good uh, rangers and wizards. Again, sort of the halfway between a human and an elf. It's a, a, an elf-human hybrid. That's a half-elf. Next is a half-orc. Hopefully everyone knows what an orc is from you know, Lord of the Rings, popularized orcs. Big, scary, green-skinned, large-toothed um, humanoids. So a half-orc. is half-human, half-orc. So they've got some of the traits of an orc. Which means they're going to be really big, really strong, um, six, seven feet tall, um, great barbarians, great fighters. Um, your half-orc could be again, raised in a half-orc raised in a human society or a half-orc raised in an orc society. A lot of times it can be outcasts because humans don't normally trust orcs and orcs don't normally trust humans. So they're a fun character to play in that regard. Um, very good barbarians, very good fighters. Um, that is half work. Next is halfling. A uh, halfling is another name for a hobbit from the Lord of the Rings. So a halfling or a half man or a hobbit are short in stout, short in stature, um, three, four to three and a half feet tall, um, about three feet tall, 40, 45 pounds. Obviously, they're not going to be frontline fighters. They're not going to have a lot of constitution, but they are going to be very nimble. They're small, they're nimble, they have high dexterity. They're also very lucky. They have a, an ability called luck that lets them get some free rerolls. Um, unlike the, uh, the, the Tolkien hobbits, though, the halflings in Dungeons and Dragons do love adventure. They're not, uh, they're not afraid of going out into the world and um, getting in adventures. So that is Halfling. Whoa, what did I just do there? I already mentioned humans. Uh, again, we know what a human is, hopefully. Very uh, gen general, so they can be anything. They can be good at anything. Uh, last is Tiefling. A Tiefling is a human with either demonic or devil blood in them. So some kind of demonic pact had taken place. Tieflings often, tieflings often have some sort of horns, or maybe a tail, maybe claws, uh, sometimes different colored skin or hair. They've got some sort of demonic trait to them. doesn't mean they're evil, uh, but it means they have an, what's called an infernal bloodline. They've got in their heritage some, um, some demonic or devil blood that has changed their appearance. Um, 
So they're very intelligent. They're also very charismatic. They're a very strong force of will. So they make great warlocks. Um, kind of an interesting class. They only started, uh, only added to the game a few editions ago. Whoa. So those are your races. So if you're designing a character, you basically have to pick what class do I want to be? What race do I want to be? Um, obviously, some races are better at some classes. Uh, Dragonborn tend to be fighters, barbarians, um, sorcerers. Dwarves tend to be fighters, clerics, uh, paladins. Uh, elves tend to be wizards or rangers or wiz um, uh, or sorcerers. Um, gnomes can go a lot of different ways, actually. Um, gnomes can be wizards. Gnomes can be clerics. Uh, gnomes can be even fighters. Uh, half orf, half elf, and human can be are both very generic. Um, half elves tend to be wizards because they have a high intelligence. Uh, half orcs tend to be humans, or half orcs tend to be barbarians or fighters. Um, halflings tend to be rogues, maybe monks. Humans can be anything. Uh, again, they're designed to be um, generalists. And tieflings tend to be warlocks or wizards. So you've got some choices in the player and the character you want to play. It depends on the type of role you want to have in the party. Uh, pretty much any party you want to have a good mix of frontline. I'll go back to my picture here of various adventuring parties. You have some very clear frontline fighters mixed in with some wizards and some clerics and support characters. You see a bard over here. Uh, probably a ranger mixed in with a fighter and maybe a paladin. Uh, you see a nice mix of there's a dragonborn, looks like paladin or fighter, heavily armored. This looks like a barbarian because they're lightly armored. So you have a nice mix of different classes to fill the different roles in the party. Uh, having a party of all wizards or a party of all fighters is difficult to run. It comes up against some very difficult challenges. So you want to be able to work together as a group. Once you're actually playing the game, Roll 20 is again the environment we're going to play in. We would play on a map like this. You would have a little, what's called a token, that would represent your character. You can move around the map, make decisions, make attacks, and most of the dice rolling and the uh, mechanical parts of the game are handled for you by this Roll 20 environment. It makes it really nice. So if you want to attack somebody, say with my longbow, I just click longbow here, and over here in the chat, this is the chat tab, it will roll the dice and show you what you rolled and what you, uh, how much damage you did. Uh, if I want to swing with my greatsword, I just click greatsword, and it'll roll the greatsword to see whether or not I hit the, uh, the enemy. Say, for example, I got some goblins here I'm trying to fight. Let's move these, let's move this out of the way. So if I'm trying to fight this goblin, <clears throat> I would roll my weapon, see if I hit him, see what kind of damage I did. And you can see the goblin's life bar there. Uh, say you did five points of damage. Let me do this again. I would type minus five, and we see the goblin is down to two hit points, almost, almost dead. Um, If we wanted to shoot him with our longbow, we'd roll that, see the results here, and apply those. So the game makes it very easy. That's how you would attack if you take damage. So this is your character here. This is the more hit points you have left. You would just hit, say I took four damage, I'd type minus four, and you'll see I have four hit points left out of my eight. Um, combat isn't the only part of the game, though. Uh, again, in Dungeons and Dragons, interacting with the people you you, uh, you people you meet, the um, what's called NPCs or non-player characters, the allies you might come across, the friends or foes. Sometimes negotiating is more important than fighting. Um, sometimes it's dealing with your environment, leaping over barricades, or or trying to calm the uh, the animal it's trying to you're trying to ride. You have skills for that. So these are all your skills here. And they work just kind of just like your attacks. Um, if you are trying to locate something, that's based on your wisdom, you'd make a perception roll. So I just click on perception, 
and it rolls the dice here for you and it tells me how good you have perceived something, whether or not you spotted a trap that you're coming up upon. Um, if you're trying to weather a storm or, or track an individual, that's based on survival. You roll your survival ability and see how well you're doing uh, based on a target number. So I might say roll, in, roll a perception check. If you rolled a 15 or higher, in this case you got a 21, that's really good. If you rolled a 15 or higher, you notice the trap. If you rolled a 20 or higher, you're going to notice the trap and the mechanism that, that triggers it. So the higher you roll, the more information you're going to gain. If you rolled below a 15, you just don't see the trap. Um, here's a history roll. So if you come across an ancient artifact, you'd make, say, a history roll based on your intelligence. Uh, in this case, you only rolled a 9, so you didn't know anything about that artifact. If you'd rolled, say, a 15 or a 16, then you'd say, oh, yeah, that's from a, an ancient race of snake men. And you would then have information you share with the party to help you on your um, uh, you know, determining who you're actually trying to fight here. So there's a lot of skills over here that are become just as important as your attacks. Um, so we'd use these down here throughout the, throughout the adventure to, again, there's athletics. If you're jumping over a, a barricade or... If um, you've been ensnared by a by a web from a giant spider, you might try to use your athletics to, we to wiggle out. Um, acrobatics, if you're trying to leap across a chasm or, or jump onto a moving horse. You roll that, you got a 20. That's a pretty good chance of succeeding. And the game runner, the dungeon master, in this case it would be me, I would set the, the target roll here, what's called a DC or difficulty class. So these attributes are just as important as your attack attributes in a lot of ways. Um, and again, these you have some choice in these, but these are also dictated by your class. So if you're a fighter, you don't really have access to the performance skill. If you're a bard or a rogue, you might. If you are a, uh, a wizard, you're going to have access to the arcana, learning things that are arcane, uh, but not acrobatics, because wizards don't spend a whole lot of time doing acrobatic things. If you're a druid, lives in the woods or a ranger that's in the woods, you're going to have access to animal handling. Um, if you're a cleric who does a lot of healing or a druid who does healing, you're going to have access to medicine uh, and tending to wounds. So your class and your race will dictate what you have access to and what you're best at. Um, up here we have what are called saving throws. These are used uh, whenever there's attack, a non-physical attack against you. So if somebody's shooting an arrow at you or trying to hit you with a club, you're going to use your armor class. However, if someone is casting a spell at you, um, maybe trying to electrocute you or maybe trying to freeze you, it doesn't matter what your armor class is. They don't have to hit you. It's some effect that you have to try to resist. So these are, think of these as kind of resistances. So if somebody casts a spell and there's suddenly a ball of flame right on top of you, it doesn't matter what your armor is, you need to be dexterous enough to dodge out of the way. So you would roll your dexterity here, and I would say, oh, you need a 13 or higher. You rolled a 16, you dodged out of the way, and you took no damage, or took maybe half damage from that. So those saving throws, basically you're rolling a dice, it's a, roll, it's a throw of the die to avoid a damage or avoid some effect. Um, so these are part of your defenses along with armor class. Um, again, you click on them and it shows you the results right here in the, the chat dialog. And you can chat to your friends here. Uh, but typically you're going to use this dialog to see your roles and to see the results of our interactions in the environment. All right, there's some other interesting things here in the character sheet. We're not going to go into a lot of it in great detail. The equipment you might have. Um, your initiative is here is based mostly on how quick you are. That's how fast you will go. Who goes first? Uh, in the order of combat. Whenever we have a, an actual combat, we'll take turns. Whoever has the highest initiative goes first. Second highest initiative goes second. Third highest initiative goes third. This is your speed. Every turn you can move that far, so 30 feet. In our game, each square is five foot. So if I move to here, uh, the game, if you hit the X key in the game, it tells me, oh, you moved 15 feet. So I can move a little further, I can go to here. There's 10 more feet, I've moved 25 feet, and I can now have five more feet to move around. So you can move up to your speed during a turn and do one action. That action could be casting a spell, swinging a sword, shooting a bow. 
and those dice rolls will, will dictate how those go. Um, also in your character sheet, there's some places for some personality traits, ideals, bonds, flaws. Um, you want to make your character interesting. Uh, you don't want to have a one-note character. They should be a real person in your mind. Um, so you want to kind of fill those out. There could be some, some background information here. This tab here is kind of is a technical tab. Don't worry about that. That's for the DM to handle. Um, but there are three tabs here in your character sheet. Here's your bio where you might have some, uh, some character appearance traits, uh, any allies or people you meet along the way, any additional feats or powers you gain, any treasure you acquire in your adventures. And this down here is some character backstory. You want to have some backstory for your character and make them interesting. Why are they an adventurer? Why are they an outcast? Why do they think it's important to fight and to, get, gain, to, gain, to gain glory and honor? Uh, why are they out there fighting? And if you're a spellcaster, there will be a spells page. This is a fighter. He has no spells, so this is pretty much blank. If you are a spellcaster, let me switch to our journal here. This is a very shoot. Here's a character in this game that I'm playing with some friends. This is the spell page. So you can see there are some spells listed here, some spells listed here. Uh, this is a very low level character, so she doesn't have a whole lot of higher level spells. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 is the level of the spell. Um, as you go on adventures, you will, your character will advance in levels. You will level up just like you do in a lot of games. And when you level up, you will gain more hit points, you'll gain more abilities, and you'll gain more spells if you're a spellcaster. So these are first level spells here. These are second level spells. She doesn't have any yet. And if you look here, there's this little eye, this little informational tab. You click on that, you can get the full description of how your spell works. If it does damage, you can click on it, and it will roll that damage for you and tell you exactly what your spell did. Okay. If it's a spell that doesn't do damage, say it's a utility spell, so for example, Mage Hand is a spell literally where just a magical hand grabs something for you. It's not a combat spell. It's like for pulling a lever or for uh, grabbing a, um, a key or something that you can't reach. So when you click it, it doesn't do any damage. It doesn't roll any dice, but instead over here in the dialogue, it shows you a description of the spell. So you, you and all the people in the party can read it and see what the spell does. Uh, most spellcasters will have what's called slots. So you're allowed to cast X number of spells per per day, essentially. So this character has three spells per day, and you can sort of keep track of how many you have left throughout the adventure. You may have noticed these up here. These are zero-level spells. These are first-level spells. These are zero-level spells, or what are called cantrips. Cantrips you can cast as many times as you want. So there's no limit on how many times you can cast these. So these are spells which are called at-will spells. You can cast them at will as many times as you want during the day. So in this case, Shocking Grasp, you literally reach out and try to electrocute somebody. You click on that, and you can see it's basically going to attack roll. So swinging a sword, you're grabbing somebody and electrocuting them. Um, this is Chill Touch, sort of same thing. You're trying to um, freeze somebody, so you're basically kind of shooting out a freeze ray. If you're not sure what the spell does, you can click on that little eye, a little informational thing, and it gives you what exactly the spell looks like. So a little ghostly skeletal hand reaches out on up to 120 feet to freeze somebody, and it does a, a certain amount of damage, which the game rolls for you. So if you're a spellcaster, you have some spells here. You might have a bio or some it's a, a picture you've chosen. Most of the characters in this game have chosen a picture to represent them. This is the journal tab of the game. Here you can see all the different characters in the game. You can see what your, your compatriots look like. Normally you won't see this stuff. This is for the game runner to see. But there might be uh, maps and things like that. Um, uh, like treasure maps or notes or something that you've been given that might... Ah, there we go. Where you find a, a note from an enemy. These might pop up here so you can review what's going on in the game. Um, see the uh, the notes you might have found or the tasks or quests you've acquired. So, that's a very, very quick introduction to Dungeons & Dragons. Um, 
Again, this is Roll20, the virtual tabletop environment we'd be playing on. Hopefully you have an idea of how that will work. Um, basically, in combat, you take actions, you move your movement amount, you can cast spells, you can attack. But don't be limited by that. Um, your attributes um, define what you do. So it's not just I walk up and attack. Uh, if you see here, there's a, a pool of water. You might want to use your, your dexterity or your acrobatic skill to jump over the pool, get behind this, go this, this goblin, and attack him from, be from behind. Or there's a bunch of rubble over here, a bunch of treasure. Maybe as a rogue, you want to come hide in that rubble. And where's our rogue? Here's the, here's the party's rogue. He's going to use his stealth, which he's very good at, to sort of hide, to set up a sneak attack. He's got a very high stealth roll here. 23 is really good. So he's going to be able to hide in there and wait for a bad guy to come by and then use his sneak attack effectively. So there's really no limit to what you can do. If you want to set up a trap for a, for a, for a bad guy or work together in tandem to, to trip somebody or something like that, um, Whatever you want to do, you tell the DM, that would be me in this case, and there'll be some role involved to see if it's successful. So you're only limited by your own imagination. So that's how you you know, fight in the combat or explore a dungeon or uh, find a trap, whatever it is you're doing. Um, your imagination kind of dictates what you, what you want to do, and your character's abilities will define you know, how good it is you are doing that thing. Here we go. So that's kind of a basic Dungeons and Dragons in a nutshell. There's a lot we didn't cover, but it's a lot that can be covered in game, a lot you can learn along the way. That should be enough to get you started and have you start thinking about the type of character you want to play. Again, you have to pick, if you come here to the eye, a race, elf, human, orc, dwarf, a class, Barbarian, Bard, Cleric, Druid, Fighter, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, Rogue, Sorcerer, Warlock, Wizard. Uh, and those two things will dictate uh, kind of what your attributes and abilities look like. Okay, So a lot to think about, but once you've played a little bit, it's relatively intuitive and relatively easy, I promise. So hope to see you uh, playing in the future. Take care.